All right, 8.4, inequalities of combined functions. So rather than saying, okay, we're gonna add these two functions together, or we're gonna subtract, find the difference between these two functions, or we're gonna multiply the functions, or we're gonna put one function inside a function, uh, what we're gonna do is we're actually going to, let's just say, draw two functions and find out where f of x has a greater value than g of x. Where is it higher? Well, it's higher in this range, all the way this way, and it's greater in value once it crosses over again all the way in this range, right? Or we might say, where is g of x greater than f of x? Well, g of x is greater than f of x throughout this interval, wherever it's higher on the graph than f of x. So that's what we're doing today. It does involve a little bit of what we did yesterday because in order to solve it, you can create a difference of functions. Uh, but we'll get into that as we move along. So does it go straight into example one? Yeah. Example one, we have let f of x be x, let g of x be x minus 2 squared. Uh, what type of function is f of x? Linear. G of x? Quadratic. OK, so we're going to have a quadratic and a linear. They're going to cross each other twice. So on one side, one is going to be greater. And in the middle, the other one's going to be greater. OK? So here we go. We need to graph on the same set of axes in order to compare these and then identify their points of intersection. Okay, The graphing, do you guys have a, a grid drawn for you? Yeah. So f of x is pretty straightforward. f of x equals x is just a diagonal line, the slope of 1 going through the origin. Label f of x. And I'm going to make it pretty long. G of x is a parabola in the shape of y equals x squared that has been translated to the right two units. So it has its vertex at 2. And that means it's going to have a y-intercept of 4. Of course, your graph will be much more beautiful than mine. X-axis, Y-axis. All right. Uh, we can see from our graph, if you did a good job graphing, the points of intersection. Okay. The point of intersection here are at 1, 1 and at 4, 4. Now if you can't see those, it's okay because you know algebra and you can find your, use your algebra skills to figure out where these lines intersect. Basically where they intersect is where f of x equals g of x. Well, f of x is x g of x is x minus 2 squared. And all I have to do to find out where they intersect is solve that equation. Now I solve an equation by grouping all my like terms and making it equal 0. First thing I need to do is expand this right side. So on the right side, x minus 2 squared, we should know the pattern. It's x squared minus 4x plus 4. And now I want to get all of my terms together with 0 on the left side, so I'm going to subtract x from both sides. And now to solve this quadratic, I want to factor the right side. So I'm looking for two numbers that will add to negative 5 and multiply to positive 4. So negative 4 and negative 1 tells me that my solutions are x equals 4 and x equals 1. Those are the x values where these 
two functions intersect. I can find the y values by just plugging them into either equation. Uh, f of x equals x is really easy to work with. If I plug 4 into there, then I get a y value of 4. And if I plug 1 into there, I get a y value of 1. So the two points of intersection are indeed 4, 4 and 1, 1. It's a bit of a throwback review to grade 10. Intersections of a curve and a line or intersections of two functions. So now in B, we want to illustrate where, first of all, f of x is greater than g of x, and then where g of x is greater than f of x. Uh, there's two different ways to do that. Number one is just to look visually. So if we're doing it visually, we can see that f of x, which is my blue line, is greater than g of x in between our points of intersection. Right? The line has a greater value in between the points of intersection, but as we move to the right of 4, and as we move to the left of 1, then our red function, g of x, is greater for the rest of it, all the way to infinity and to negative infinity. Okay? But in between here, in between 1 and 4, uh, the line is greater. So we can use interval notation. We can say this is true from 1 to 4, exclusive of the points 1 and 4, because they're equal at that point. Okay? If this were greater than or equal to, then we'd have to use square brackets. And then here, there are two intervals where g of x is greater than f of x. It's from negative infinity all the way up to our first intersection point, which happens at x coordinate of 1, x value of 1, and from 4 all the way up to positive infinity. Okay? Uh, I'm going to set out this word and for a new symbol. Okay? A new symbol. The symbol is a big fat U. It means the union of. So that means it can be in this interval or this interval, and it will still satisfy this inequality. So this is the union of this interval and this interval. They're both included equally in the answer. The other way to find out where f of x is greater than g of x is to analyze the difference function. So what we're saying there is that uh, we need to create a difference function. So we're actually going to subtract g of x from both sides, which is going to leave us with f of x minus g of x is greater than 0. Well, now we're set up at, we have an equal 0, or well, uh, 0 is on the one side of our inequality already, and over here we have a difference of two functions. So we'll just plug in our functions. f of x is x. We're going to subtract the whole function, x minus 2 squared. And be careful with this in your expansion. You want to keep everything that you expand here in a, in a group, because that negative symbol is going to get applied to every term in the group once we're through expanding it. So here we go. We expand this. We already did this. So it's x squared minus 4x plus 4 is greater than 0. Distribute that negative sign to all of the terms in order to get rid of the brackets. So we have negative x squared. We have positive 4x and we have negative 4. Still all greater than 0. Combine like terms. We have negative x squared plus 5x minus 4 is greater than 0. So now we can work with this and basically just find out for what values of x is this inequality, is this function, this difference function, greater than 0. Okay? Uh, I don't personally love working with a negative 
uh, initial coefficient that's negative. So what I can actually do is I can multiply this whole thing by negative 1. But then we remember when we're working with an inequality, that means we have to flip the sign. So anytime you multiply by a negative number or divide by a negative number, you have to flip the sign. So you can do it like this, it's not a problem, or you can change all the signs and flip the inequality. So now we're looking for where x squared minus 5x plus 4 is less than 0. Okay? In order to do that, I still want to factor it, and then I want to check my intervals using an interval chart. So we've already factored this. I know that this is, um, or we could deal with multiple cases. So this is x plus, uh, minus 4, x minus 1 is less than 0. So we can check our cases here, um, or we can use an interval chart. If you're going to check your cases, you would say, OK, uh, one of them has to be positive and one of them has to be negative in order for it to be below 0, right? because the product of a positive and a negative is going to be a negative, which is what we're looking for. So there's two cases that you could check. Or you can make a little interval chart. Basically, you can ask, OK, maybe I'll move this up to here. for x values between, uh, in my first interval, which is negative infinity to 1, what's happening? And then from 1 to 4, what's happening? And then from 4 to positive infinity, what's happening? And all I want to know is, is it going to be positive or negative? If it's negative, then it is a solution to our difference function inequality. If it's positive, then it's not. So if I pick any number between negative infinity and 1, I'll pick 0. It's really easy. That means this bracket becomes negative 4 times negative 1, which is a positive number. So that does not work. The interval from 1 to 4, let's choose the number 2. 2 minus 4 is a negative number. 2 minus 1 is a positive number. Negative times a positive is negative. That's good. It's less than 0. And then we'll go from 4 to infinity. Let's pick 5. I get positive. 5 minus 4 is positive. 5 minus 1 is positive. Positive times positive is a positive, so that doesn't work. Okay, so that strategy tells me that uh, f of x is greater than g of x. over the interval 1 to 4. I could do the same strategy or just use logic to say g of x is greater than f of x over my other two intervals. Negative infinity to 1, the union of negative infinity to 1 and 4 to positive infinity. Okay, so we can visualize it just by drawing the two functions and seeing where they are at. Uh, that works for these kind of simple functions. It's more difficult for functions that are more difficult to draw, unless you're graphing them on Desmos. Or we can create a difference function and then just deal with that function. Because as long as I've done everything properly algebraically, then the solutions to this function will be the exact same as the solutions to our original inequality. Example 2 we're going to do on Desmos because we cannot solve this inequality using algebraic techniques. So we're going to use Desmos. We're going to graph both of these functions, sine x and log of x. We're going to identify the points of intersection using Desmos. And then from there, we can just write down the intervals where sine of x is greater than the log of x. The other way to do it, of course, would be to create a difference function which would put us at, if I subtracted log x from both sides, I'd get the sine of x minus the log of x is greater than 0. And then I could just find out where this curve is above the x-axis, wherever it's greater than 0. Let's head to Desmos. In example 3, we are looking at inventory control for a computer store. They want to know how many computers they should be storing. 
in inventory in order to minimize their costs for the amount of space that they have in uh, their warehouse. So a computer store's cost C for shipping and storing N computers can be modeled by C with respect to N is equal to 1.5 N plus 200,000 over N. And the storage capacity of the store's warehouse is 750 units. So that's actually, uh, that's going to be a restriction on the domain, right? Storage capacity 750 units. Okay, we're going to graph this function and explain the shape. Then find the domain of interest for this problem. So if we graph this, we're not going to do it by hand. I'll just give you what it looks like. We can pretend that we did it on Desmos. The graph looks something like that. Okay? Uh, what is its shape with respect to n? Well, if you have very few computers, the cost of storing and shipping is very high per computer. But the more you ship and store, the less it costs overall per unit to ship and store. And then as you get to max capacity, or maybe this is even beyond max capacity, I don't know, uh, it gets more and more expensive to store. So we want to find out uh, what's our restriction? Are we ever going to be able to store more than 750 units? No, that's their max capacity. So that's the domain of interest. The domain of interest would be from 0 to 750, right? And the shape of the graph is defined by this uh, sum of functions. So it's kind of the superposition principle that we talked about earlier. If you had the function 1.5n, which is linear, and you did the superposition principle, you added 200,000 over n, which is a rational function, which would look something like that, right? So we're basically adding this function to this function, and this is what we ended up with. You can kind of see how that works out. This line is pulling up this curve. Kind of makes sense, eh? Good. Uh, so the domain, let's talk about the domain, the domain of CN is N belonging to the set of real numbers such that N is greater than zero because we're storing computers, they're not going to store less than zero computers, you can't have that, a negative number, doesn't make any sense. So now, in B, B is to determine the minimum and maximum number of computers that can be ordered at any one time to keep the cost below 1500 bucks, assuming that their current inventory is zero. So basically what we're looking for is if we have this cost line of $1,500, we want to know the number of computers here and here so that they can order within this range, the minimum number of computers and the maximum number of computers that will keep their costs below $1,500 mark. Okay, So in order to do that, we're just going to say that we want C of N to be less than $1,500. Okay, We can sub in what we know. We know C of N is 1.5 N plus 200,000 over N, and we want that to be less than 1,500. Now in order to solve this, I need to get it, it's easier if I get it equal to, or if I get zero on the right side of my inequality. So I'm going to subtract 1,500 from both sides. And 
I could go ahead and use a graphing calculator. I'll show you what that looks like on Desmos in a second. But we can also solve this using uh, paper and pencil. So just what we have here. Uh, I'm going to multiply because I don't want to deal with this rational, this 200 over n. I'm actually going to multiply both sides by n. So multiply both sides by n. That will give me 1.5 n squared plus 200,000 minus 1500 n is less than zero. Now when I multiplied by n, I knew that I was multiplying by a positive number. Why is that important? What would I have to do if I multiplied by a negative number? I'd have to flip that inequality. Okay. So if n could be positive or negative, I'd have to split this into two cases. Do where it's n is positive with an inequality looking like this. And then case two, where n is a negative number, I'd have to flip the inequality. Okay. Now that I have this, I can use a quadratic formula to solve. But before I can do that, I need to rearrange my equation in descending powers of n. So that I have a, b, and c. All right. Here we go. x equals negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. which simplifies to uh, minus a negative is a positive. So apply that negative one to negative 1500. You get positive 1500 plus or minus. And inside this whole bracket, you can just put that under the radical. You can just put that in your calculator. And you will get 1,050,000 all over 3. So we have 1500 plus the radical divided by 3 and then 1500 minus this number divided by 3 and your calculator is smart enough to punch out these solutions 158 or 842. Now those are the places where they intersect. Those are the places where this function on the left equals the function on the right. So that tells us that if we scroll back up to our graph, that this x value happens at 158 computers in stock, and this intersection happens at 842 computers in stock. So their cost is lower than $1,500 when they have more than 158 computers or and less than uh, 842 computers. Can they have 842 computers in stock? No. Their capacity, 750 units. Okay, so the number of computers that they would ever do in a shipment would be from 159 to 750 computers. That will keep the cost below $1,500. Uh, we can make a little final statement somewhere down here. Since the warehouse has a max capacity of 750 shipments 
should be between 159 and 750 to keep costs below 1500. Uh, why not 158? Because that's where it will equal zero, but we want to be below zero. So 158 is where the cost will equal 1500. We want where will the cost be below 1500. So we have to go one more this way. You could say 158.1, but I don't think you can get one tenth of a computer in a shipment. Okay, C says, what is the optimum order size that will minimize storage costs? So now we're not looking for a range of values. We're looking for the order size that will minimize cost. So it's somewhere down here. It's the minimum of this function. Uh, we can't do that algebraically, so we just punch it into Desmos, use the find the minimum uh, calculation on either Desmos or a calculator. And then that will give us the minimum cost. See, we're just going to give the answer. The minimum cost occurs when 365 computers are ordered. Right there is 365. And the corresponding cost for this size of order, it will cost, this is just the y coordinate of that point, $1,095. Okay, the last part of this is just thinking a little bit about what we did. Why might this not be the best number to order? Yeah, it's the most cost effective for storage and for shipping, but why might you not want to order 365? Why might you want to order less or why might you want to order more as a manufacturer who's selling computers? Yeah, if the demand is higher, if you can sell more than that, then you want to have more than that, right? But let's say you can't sell that many, you can only sell 100. Do you want to just have an extra 265 sitting around? No, okay? So supply and demand is also uh, a consideration if you're actually storing computers and selling them. Okay, you can find your practice problems on the following pages in the textbook, starting at page 457.